Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This webinar is presented by the Center for the Assessment of Tobacco Regulations. As participants are still joining over the next minute or so, I'd like to provide a few logistical reminders to everyone. All attendees are in listen only mode, so you're muted for the duration of the event. Um, at the end of the event, there will be about 10 minutes for discussion. So please submit any questions that you have to the Q&A box. And you should see that at the bottom of your screen. Um, you, should, you can submit them at any time during the webinar. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded and we will archive it on our center website following the event. I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited for today's webinar with Dr. Epstein and I will hand it over to Dr. David Mendez. He is the co-lead of our Castor Career Enhancement Corps. Good afternoon. Um, I'm David Mendez, and uh, today uh, the Center for the Assessment of Tobacco Regulation is honored to have Dr. Joshua Epstein as a speaker of today's seminar. Uh, the Epstein, Dr. Epstein is an international recognized expert in the modeling of complex social dynamics using mathematical and computational methods, and a pioneer in the method of agent-based modeling. He holds a BA from Amherst College and a PhD in political science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Currently, he is a professor of epidemiology in the New York University School of Global Public Health and founding director of the NYU Agent-Based Model Laboratory with affiliated appointments at the Grand Institute of Mathematical Sciences and the College of Arts and Sciences. Prior to joining NYU, he was a professor of emergency medicine at John, at John Hopkins University and director of the Center for Advanced Modeling in the Social Behavior and Health Sciences with joint appointments in economics, applied mathematics, international health and biostatistics. Before that, he was a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution and director of the Center on Social and Economic Dynamics. Using agent-based models, he has made numerous and very important contributions to the study of infectious diseases, and uh, such as Ebola, pandemic influenza, smallpox, among others, and vector-borne diseases uh, such as Zika, urban disaster preparedness, contagious violence, evolution of norms, economic dynamics, computational, computational archaeology, and the emergence of social classes, among other many topics many other topics. For this multiple and innovative contribution to science, he was awarded the NIH Director's Pioneer Award in 2008, an honorary doctor of science from Amher Co Amher Amherst College in 2010, and was elected to the Society of Sigma Psi in 2018. Today, Dr. Epstein will talk about the growing relevance of complex systems approaches to the comprehensive understanding and treatment of public health problem. Uh, with, without more ado, please welcome today's speaker, Dr. Joshua Epstein. You have to unmute yourself, I uh, Josh. Thank you, David, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to the whole Castor leadership for inviting me to give this seminar. I'm very honored to be here. And want to talk about applications of complex systems approaches to public health challenges. We've already, uh, whoops, why isn't this advancing? Oh, my screen, ah, there we go. David already mentioned these affiliations, so I won't repeat them. Uh, I wanted to talk on two approaches and the dialogue between them. One approach is nonlinear dynamical systems. These are classical differential equation models that are continuous time, homogeneous pools, deterministic, and are perfectly mixed, and are pillars of the study of contagious phenomena. And I want to contrast that with agent-based models, which are artificial societies of software people. These unfold in discrete time on a daily basis, typically. Individuals are heterogeneous. They're not pooled. There's randomness, and there's space. And I believe both approaches are illuminating, and the dialogue between them is mutually illuminating, and I, I hope to convince you of that. Uh, I'll show lots of applications at various scales, from the playground scale to the planetary scale, and uh, touching on health challenges from pandemics to addictions. So, you know, 
of course, I'm going to have to go very fast. It's a bit of a blitz. Uh, so if you, you know, bear with me, if you will, and uh, keep questions for, for, for the end, and I'm happy to address them now or later or as we go. Okay. Um, all right. So a lot of these topics involve contagion in general. And even toy models can reveal core principles of contagion dynamics, infectious diseases, but also the spread of opinions, rumors, uh, all sorts of phenomena. So let's just talk about epidemics for the moment, contagious epidemics. And we begin with a playground epidemic with 100 kids. Here's the playground. It's a green playground. Uh, blue kids are healthy. Red kids are sick. They're going to move around the playground at random. There's some per contact transmission probability that's just arbitrary and a per day death probability. So what you're going to see is we start with one sick kid. They all mill around. When a red bumps into a blue, he sneezes on him, gives him the bug with some probability, and every day the sick person has some chance of dying. So with no vaccine, no distancing, no immunity, no nothing, here's what happens on the plate. Pretty soon he starts to spread the bug to healthy kids. They become sick and spread it to others. Red kids are departing the playground. You can think of them as going to the infirmary or staying home, but you know, I'm kind of morbid, so I prefer to think of them as dead. All right, so here it goes. Now it's really taking off. You can see that it starts to spread very quickly. Um, and pretty soon we'll see the unfortunate outcome on this little toy playground. Okay, I'll speed it up. Pretty soon everybody's dead. All right. Now, everybody got it and they all died. Interventions, of course, are meant to avoid that and protect as many healthy, susceptible kids as possible. The huge tools for infectious diseases like COVID-19 are vaccination, which is a ways off, and social distancing, which is an immediate and essential measure. Uh, but let's talk about vaccine in principle, just again to illustrate that even toy models can give you rather deep insights. Let's go back to the playground, 100 kids, everybody got it, they all died. Now imagine a perfect vaccine and we vaccinate 60 kids right up front. We pre-vaccinate them with perfect vaccine. Okay, so 60 kids survive, right? I mean, you're a sophisticated audience. But I think if you went up to the person on the street and said, excuse me, 100 kids have this disease, they all died. If I vaccinate 60, 60 will survive. I think that would be the everyday intuition. And here's how it really goes. Uh, here's this red sick kid again, the index case. Blue kids are healthy and yellow kids are pre-vaccinated. If it were true that vaccination protected only the vaccinees, then the only kids alive at the end would be the yellow kids. So is that what happens? And again, when you look at any of the runs I show today, these are single realizations of a stochastic process. Technically, they're sample paths of a stochastic process. And you run them again and again and again and build up some sort of serious statistical performance of model behavior that you then compare to data. So these are very useful as uh, thought-provoking runs, but they're individual runs and you should always present them and consume them with care. What you see is that, of course, at the end of the epidemic, it's not just the yellow kids that survive, but there's blue kids as well. They confer, the vaccinees confer secondary protection on these unvaccinated susceptibles. And we all know the word for that. It's herd immunity. More than 60 survive. So you don't have to immunize everybody to quash the epidemic. You have to immunize just enough so that it fizzles out. And I think that's already uh, just a purely toy model uh, suggests that is a very deep thing. That's a counterintuitive result. And so, you know, even if, one, if I wanted to teach high school kids about epidemiology, that would be a nice way to start. Okay, so what fraction of the population has to be vaccinated? To a first approximation, and we'll talk about this, all kinds of stringent assumptions, the vaccination fraction has to exceed one minus one over something. What's the parameter that's all over the news uh, if we were in a seminar, I'd ask you to 
put up your hands and tell me. But of course, it's the famous R naught. And <laughs> excuse me, the R naught interpretation is this is the average number of direct infections from one infected person in a susceptible pool. You put everybody in a bowl, you mix it vigorously, you drop one infected in. How many immediate susceptibles get the bug? Not the next generation of new people they infect or they infect. It's just the first round. And if it's two, then of course you have to pre-vaccinate one minus one over R naught, one over two or a half the population, or get them out of harm's way through isolation, closures, cancellation of events, mass travel, other measures. And in fact, the 1918 pandemic, Ebola, and the early phase of COVID-19 were all around R naught of two. Of course, we fell short uh, in containing COVID. We'll come back to that. But these are nice insights. Uh, let's, let's now do the classical model. What you've looked at is really the agentization of a classical mathematical model that some of you may be familiar with. It's the Kermack mckendrick model from 1927. It's called the SIR model because the compartments, the pools are susceptibles, infecteds, and removes. And there's a flow from the susceptible pool into the infected pool as you get infected, and a flow out of the infected pool into the removed or dead pool as you die. And, <coughs> excuse me, for those of you who are not familiar with calculus, the left-hand side just means the rate of change of the susceptible pool, rate of change of the infected, and rate of change of the removed. So people flow from susceptible to infected and out into the removed pool. It's a perfect mixing model because everything depends on the product of susceptibles and infected. Why is that perfect mixing? Because what it's saying is, line all the susceptibles up in a row, line all the infecteds up in another row, and have each infected march down the row of susceptibles and sneeze in the face of each susceptible. That's S times I sneezes, and they transmit with probability beta. And so you get these simple equations. All right, now the, this really gave the first rigorous account that epidemics are threshold phenomena. What do I mean by an epidemic? I mean, the growth rate in the infected pool, the IDT, is positive. But the right-hand side was just this, beta SI minus gamma I. So the thing takes off if the susceptible pool is greater than the removal rate over the transmission rate, and it fizzles otherwise. And this is the condition for herd immunity, that the remaining susceptible pool be less than this number, the removal rate over the transmission rate you're removing more than are transmitting, right? Something like that, that's the intuition. Uh, if we rearrange this, it's beta S over gamma greater than one, and that is the famous formula for R naught. And if R naught's greater than one, you get an epidemic, and if R naught's less than one, you get none. There are fancy definitions of R naught for people who are inclined uh, to look at this more mathematical literature, but this is what we need, and if you rearrange things and subtra just subtract V from the susceptible pool, then it's S minus V is less than this threshold that fizzles out. But that's to say V is greater than one minus one over R naught. Okay, I know that's a blitz. We can all go through that slowly, but I wanted you to see how you arrive at this very pretty formula. Uh, and all in all, that model, I would say, is a triumph of elegant analytical modeling. Picasso said, art is a lie that helps us see the truth. I think that's true of this model, and actually for all the best models. It gave very important qualitative insights, uh, and the combination of the agent model and the differential equation model is very, is very nice. And the model, the classical model, works very well in these well-mixed playground type settings. So here's the toy model. Susceptibles are falling, infectives are rising, and uh, removeds are being taken off to the hospital. And that's exactly what you see in many, many data sets, like this one, where uh, it's an English boys' school in the dead of winter. All the windows are closed. The kids are eating out of the same bowls or whatever, whatever they do. And uh, you see exactly these relationships. Okay, so it's a very elegant model, gave important insights, but 
what if the contacts aren't uniform? What if it isn't perfect mixing? What if it's contacts on a metro system or an airline system or the international airline system? In these settings, the well-mixed models will be misleading and they can miss very important intervention strategies. Uh, so let's increase the scale and the spatial fidelity and quickly run through some larger models all en route to the discussion of behavior and agent zero, a recent model of mine. All right, so one scale up and a different threat is the urban scale. This is a model we published uh, recently, relatively recently, that's a full scale, again, combination of a mathematical model, the fluid dynamics equations that govern an aerosol, toxic aerosol, and an agent-based model of traffic flow in a complete engineering replica of Los Angeles. The building permeabilities, all these other things are, are, are exact. And the plume is modeled using reaction diffusion equations, the Navier-Stokes equations. That's higher computational fluid dynamics. And the traffic is color-coded for velocity. This, again, is the base case, do nothing scenario, really. And it's a combination of an analytical model, numerical simulation of these computational fluid dynamics equations, and an agent-based model where people can evacuate, shelter in place, do all the things humans can do. What you see in this particular run is if everyone pours out of these buildings into the downtown Los Angeles, you get very high density, high congestion, and increased exposure to the plume. So unbridled evacuation is probably not the way to go, if it's even feasible in the mega cities that we're, we're moving toward. Here are several perspectives on that same run. Upper left is more or less the same perspective. Lower right is just rotated from an, to another part of the city. And upper right is looking down on this plume as it diffuses around Los Angeles. On the lower right is a plot keeping track of the total number of agents exposed and the exposure per person in parts per million per second. This is what you care about, of course. This is what you're trying to control. And you can use this model to study all sorts of uh, measures, uh, shelter in place, evacuation, intelligent routing, changing building designs. There's a lot you can do. And an optimal combination is very, very hard to calculate, hence the need for large-scale computation. There's certainly no alternative to modeling. You can't just sit a bunch of people around the table and ask them what's the best thing to do. Uh, and I'd also note that we're not really predicting this event. We're modeling to prepare for it. Okay, so not all modeling is about prediction and so forth. So we looked at an infectious and an environmental threat. How about a vector-borne disease? Again, I'm going through these very fast. Uh, Here's a mosquito-borne threat that we did for the New York City Department of Health. Uh, here we did, uh, we built an artificial New York City to study containment strategies for Zika. There, here there are two populations, about seven and a half million humans and another million mosquitoes. And the model is incredibly detailed. It models a day in the life of the mosquito. Uh, but the only important thing is that really humans give mosquitoes Zika because mosquitoes contract Zika by biting people with Zika-infected blood. Then they go off and have another meal and inject that human with Zika-infected blood. So they're truly vectors. It's really human-to-human -human transmission mitigated or mediated by these mosquitoes. And it can also be directly transmitted through human sexual contact and mothers to newborns, which we don't really study. All right. So several transmission routes need to be included in the model. Uh, just very quickly, the constituents are, it's modeled at the level of the census tract. So here's every census tract in New York City, color-coded for population density. And as people come and go about their daily business, we have models of their itineraries, uh, they come in contact with mosquitoes. The probability of being bitten depends on the density of mosquitoes, where they go. So where are the bugs? This was a big challenge. We found the one guy in the Department of Health who knew every mosquito in New York personally and uh, gave us access to his trap data. Uh, this is the adult uh, trap, mosquito trapping data, which we were able to uh, extrapolate into a zip code level heat map of mosquito densities. 
So now when people go about their daily itineraries, going to work and school and what have you, uh, in this synthetic New York population, they traverse these areas and their probability of being bitten uh, varies accordingly. So we can track transmission, all very crudely, of course. Uh, we have the locations of home and work. We have a very, very crude representation of sexual uh, contacts, partnerships, marriages. Again, there's, there's some depth on this in the actual work. Uh, and the idea that the only thing to really know is that sexual transmission of Zika can be prevented by the use of condoms. And the interesting insight is that, you know, there's this distinction between mosquito transmission and human sexual transmission. In the Northern hemisphere, the mosquitoes are dormant from late fall till early summer. So it would be easy to conclude that for that period, unprotected sex poses no risk of Zika transmission. However, for a nice reason, it does pose that risk and vigilance is necessary year round. And here's the reason why. Here's a graph where blue is mosquito transmissions and red is sexual transmissions. So uh, if we start things in the dormant period, there's sexual transmission until spring. Now there's transmission by mosquitoes, which is the blue curve. Uh, if sexual transmission continues in the off season when the dormant, you're building up an ever and ever greater pool of Zika infected blood. And when the mosquitoes come back for the spring, the epidemic is much worse because there's much more infected blood to distribute. All right, so the dormant period, you have to still be very vigilant. Even though the mosquitoes are gone, Zika is not gone. And we tried with some success to the New York Department of Health uh, had a campaign to remind people of that. So we've looked at a playground infection, a toxic plume at the urban level, a mosquito-borne disease at the urban level. Another scale is the US national scale model. Uh, the artificial New York contained about 8 million humans. The US model is about 300 million agents roughly the population of the US calibrated to census data for age, sex, and other significant variables. It includes schools, workplaces, hospitals, even staffed beds, which has proven to be pretty essential in pandemics like COVID. Uh, large scale travel patterns are, you know, this is computationally intensive. We did all inter zip code travel. There are about 30,000 zip codes. So if you imagine a matrix, whose rows and columns are the zip codes, every matrix entry is the probability of going from zip code I to zip code J. Because there are 30,000 zip codes, there are 900 million cells in this matrix, uh, which is not a, not a simple model to invert or do other, other sorts of manipulations. Uh, some of those can be estimated econometrically, which we did, and some, of course, are ra rather unlikely. It's like, it's just quite unlikely that people on Fifth Avenue are gonna go to Fargo, North Dakota that frequently. So some of the entries are, are nearly zero. In any event, that's the main contact dynamic in the model. And the transmission rates, incubation periods, fatality, all these are taken from the literature. I'll show you this one. Black pixels are healthy. Red pixels are sick. Blue are people who've had the disease, whether they survived or not. All of this was done for NIH in the context of uh, a potential uh, bird flu epidemic. And they cared mostly about cases, not case fatality rates, which could be applied as we learned them. So below is a base case, zero response run. Everything bad starts in Los Angeles. So I say that as a New Yorker, we'll start this in LA. And again, this was published uh, in a, in a, in a high-end uh, machine computing journal. All right, we're seeing again is one realization with no response. It's about a 225 day epidemic and it gets around the country in a big hurry. All right, and you can use it to study school closures, vaccination priorities, distancing, the timing and imposition of controls and the threat of multiple waves through premature lifting of distancing measures, which is of course what we're seeing. For global pandemics, the true scale is of course Earth and we did also publish uh, a planetary scale aging based model with 6.5 6 billion agents. There's a, it's just featured in nature. And again, it's from this same paper. 
And we were, we were still, again, this was done for NIH in the context of uh, H1N1. And the question was, you know, we don't have any vaccine. We have only antiviral drugs. So HHS wanted to know, look, if this thing comes out of Thailand, do you A, send the entire stockpile of antivirals to crush it there, or B, withhold the entire stockpile of antivirals to protect Americans if it goes global? What's your answer? Now, A, again, you can't get your brain around this without modeling. You can't have any disciplined consideration of those alternatives without some model. Uh, with all of, all of its uncertainties notwithstanding. It turned out this was a project uh, for the Midas uh, group. And the answer was basically, if you, can sh if you know that you've caught the thing within 21 days of its emergence, send the stockpile, otherwise withhold it. But of course, the surveillance systems are so bad in these Asia and other parts of the world that you really don't know uh, whether you've caught it early or not. And obviously, you face this same problem with, with COVID. Uh, the, the draconian measures were, were imposed on China. But, you know, as you can see, once it gets to China, things are really rolling along. You know, cat, many cats were out of the bag. Okay, now in all of this, there's the question of behavior. We've looked at models of all kinds of scales with all kinds of threats, but all these models need to be populated with behaviorally plausible agents. And I think this is where the action is in agent-based and in mathematical modeling of contagious phenomena. Now, to go back to the classical model, the kermack mckendrick model, um, they don't include any behavioral adaptation. People just keep mixing S times I, S times I, S times I. Nobody seems to notice that there's a plague abroad in their community, and they don't change their behavior. Now, when I ask, when you ask most modelers, why don't you include behavior? They'd say, human behavior is just too hard, so we leave it out. Sorry, you're not leaving it out. You're making a very strong assumption that there's this invariant contact pattern of S times I. So you are including behavior one way or the other. Whatever your model is, you're including behavior. You're just doing it in a, in a bad way when you pretend to ignore it. <clears throat> so can we do a little better? Uh, one effort was to just to think of epidemics as a coupled contagion of disease and fear about the disease. The idea is that when the disease is high, you're afraid of the disease and you do something. You distance, you zip yourself into your basement, you isolate. That suppresses the disease. But then when the disease gets low, you lose your fear and come out of hiding. And this can ignite further waves, which is also what we're seeing. So there's two interacting contagions, one of disease, one of fear. You can get the disease only from a diseased person, but you can get fear in all kinds of ways, from contact with a diseased person, contact with purely a scared person or someone who's sick and scared. And we have a large project with uh, David Bronyatovsky at uh, George Washington, where we're, where we're using large scale Twitter mining to study the contagion of fear about COVID and also data on the true spread of COVID and try to understand how they're related. But you're getting these multiple waves by the essential mechanism I'll, I'll show you. Here's the idea. There's all these definitions. Uh, and there are these diagrams, which I hate these diagrams with all the arrows. It reminds me of the Battle of Agincourt where the sky was black with arrows. Easier for me to just understand the equations. Uh, and what you see here is, these are people susceptible to the infection and fear and everything else. They, they can be infected with fear, infected with pathogen, infected with both, and so on. And the important point about these equations is they really reduce to the classical kermack mckendrick equations. Uh, if A is the disease, is the fear transmission probability, then when A is zero, you get the classical model, beta SI out of susceptibles, beta SI into the infected, and minus gamma I into the removed pool. So with no fear, it's the classical SIR model. With fear, with only fear, it's an SIR for fear model. Here's just fear, just fear, and removal of just fear. But you're seeing the interaction of these two. And when people are recovered from fear, 
they go back into circulation. And the, re the result is that you can generate these multiple waves. Here's the story in that model. As I say, the disease starts out, susceptibles are transferring into the infected pool. So there's this spike of fear that puts people in isolation and this suppresses the red curve. But when the red curve is low enough, people get over their fear and they come out of isolation, pouring susceptibles onto the infected embers and you get a second wave. And this is exactly what we saw in uh, 1918. Here's data for all the major cities of UK and the US. And of course, <clears throat> emboldened by this, I conducted a massive, giant, big data, huge data analysis for Chicago by reading two newspapers at the time, uh, one of which is, says at the beginning of this epidemic, the blue curve, uh, the commissioner of health, Mr. Robertson, says, go home and go to bed until you're well. If you're, if you're coughing and sneezing, get the heck out of circulation. That did indeed suppress the disease, as this blue arrow indicates. And at that point, without the benefit of these equations, the commissioner concluded, hey, we're practically out of the woods. All bands are off. Uh, in just a few days, I'm sure we'll be the safest city in the world. And he was right. They were practically out of the woods. But as the toy model teaches us, even a few infectives can stimulate another wave. So, you know, this is all, uh, this is exactly what we're, what's happening now, of course, except most places haven't even suppressed the thing yet. So we'll see what happens in the fall. But I mean, this is a massive concern. And farther out is the massive concern that people will refuse vaccine when it's available, which has also historically produced multiple ways. For example, in the smallpox epidemics of the earlier centuries. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Einstein said, Theory should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. I say the data should be as big as necessary, but no bigger. And for a full analysis of these cities, Neil Ferguson and, uh, and Bootsman did a very nice analysis in PNAS where they looked at each city. All right, and that, as I say, this is what we're worrying about now. And an important agenda is to populate the large models with cognitively plausible agents. So. What, did the, what would those look like? And do I have some provisional candidate as a cognitively plausible agent? And my candidate is, you know, provisional, but it's this creature who I named Agent Zero. I was very lucky to have an NIH uh, award to work on this for about five years, which I, which I, which I did. Uh, and this is the result. The subtitle is Toward Neurocognitive Foundations for Generative Social Science. Let me talk a little bit about that. It's the third book uh, in, in, I guess, a trilogy on agent modeling. Um, but what do I mean by this generative social science? What's the generative idea? And I'm saying, look, to explain a regularity, uh, a distribution of wealth, a segregation pattern, an epidemic dynamic, I need to know how it could emerge on time scales of interest in a population of cognitively plausible agents. Does that micro world, that micro specification, that agent model generate the macroscopic target, the explananda? If so, then the micro world is a generative explanatory candidate. And my motto is if you didn't grow it, you didn't explain it. So for any X, if you didn't grow X, then you didn't explain it. Not the converse. I'm not saying any old way of growing it is explanatory. Because with some probability, the pattern would emerge at random. And that's not very explanatory. And I'm not saying it's the unique generator. There might be many. Uh, generative sufficiency is a necessary condition for explanation. But it's a very different notion than, you know, how do you explain it? Furnish a game in which the pattern is Nash. Or if you're Gary Becker, furnish a functional with respect to which the trajectory is an extremal. Or furnish a regression relating aggregate variables. I think regression and statistical analysis is incredibly valuable, and it might even be predictive that if I twiddle this aggregate variable, I'll get a different result in the aggregate dependent variable. But it is that relationship itself that we're trying to generate in an agent-based model. So that that is the relationship is established by statistics. Why it's the relationship is established by generating it from the bottom up. All right, cognitively plausible agents. What are the minimal criteria? I thought, look, humans 
have emotions. And fear is prominent, and we'll use that in Agent Zero. Yes, they deliberate, but, you know, a la Herb Simon and Daniel Kahneman and a million other uh, psychologists, it's bounded deliberative capacity, not perfect rationality. And they're connected to other agents who are emotionally driven and statistically limited. And all of those things matter. So accordingly, Agent Zero is equipped with distinct modules, an affective emotional one, a deliberative one, and a social module, all of which are grounded in contemporary neuroscience. These modules interact inside the agent to produce observable individual behavior. And when you put a bunch of them together, they generate a wide variety of collective dynamics in the fields of health, conflict, networks, economics, psychology, law. The game for me was get the synthesis started. All these modules can be refined and improved and extended and you know displaced by others. So me was don't get the modules finished, get the synthesis started, and I welcome further work on these modules, particularly in connection with addiction, uh, which I'll come to at the end. So it's all very provisional, but it's formal. There's lots of criticism of the rational actor, uh, a lot of gripes, decisive experiments, uh, behavioral economics, Kahneman, you know, a million of these results, but they don't change scientific practice unless you give a formal alternative. It's not enough to say the thing is wrong. You have to give people another option, and it has to be a mathematical one. And so Agent Zero is one of these. It's mathematical and computational and crudely addresses some of these gaps in the rational actor. All right, so before telling you about these equations, which again, we'll go through very fast, let's just walk you through how the thing works, all right? The agents, in this case, let's just imagine that they're soldiers occupying a foreign land where there are indigenous sites. The sites are not agent zeros, they're just sites that can blow up in your face or not. The agents, the agent zero agents, can destroy some sites if they're getting attacked enough. And these stimulants, these adverse effects, produce a disposition to take action. Some sites are peaceful, some fights are not. The main event is this. The agents are fear conditioning on local stimuli. They're not decision making, they're not choosing, they're being conditioned uh, under equations that we'll show you in a minute. This is the emotional part. The bounded rationality part, they're also taking data on their neighborhood. What's the relative frequency of attacks? And they're computing a simple local statistic. The sum of those is the disposition to retaliate, but they're social animals and other agents' dispositions enter in. And if the total exceeds the threshold, they act. They destroy, they flee, they do all sorts of things. Let's just show you what it is on, on a landscape. Here are the yellow sites. They're just colored patches differently so you can see them. Here are our three soldiers in this land. These are agent zeros, they're connected. These lines represent the weight with which one affects the other. This agent in the southeast, southwest, never encounters any uh, adverse uh, stimulus at all. He lives, his world is always peaceful. Uh, you're always gonna just look around in your immediate neighborhood, the north, south, east, west, so-called von Neumann neighborhood. These agents, the yellow, uh, the orange illuminations are ambushes or explosions or attacks, let's think of them. These soldiers are subject to a lot of attacks. This soldier in the lower left is never subjected to any attacks. These guys are A, fear conditioning on these orange stimuli. This is not a conscious process. They're forming an association uh, by, a, by an amygdala uh, channel. They're also taking data on their immediate neighborhood, and they're adding those variables to compute a total disposition to retaliate, which they do by wiping out sites. What's interesting, however, is that by dispositional contagion, this lower left agent also wipes out his village, even though he's never had a bad experience with the indigenous population. Let's show a movie of that. Again, this is one sample path, no stimulus, no sensory radius. He would never do anything alone. These agents are experiencing these attacks, but he attacks his village too. 
That I think is an interesting and disturbing result. We'll come back to that. So again, quickly, I, mean, I know this is a real blitz and for which I apologize, but the idea is there's some action the agent can take, binary action, refuse vaccine, dump stock, wipe out your village. Here I'm just talking about a binary act. And there's some non-negative threshold. They have an effective and deliberative module. Each of those are real valued functions bounded to the unit interval defined on a stochastic stimulus space. And each solo disposition for the moment is just their sum. We talk about this at length in, in the book, but this is the idea. It's passion plus reason. Hume said, uh, reason is a slave to the passions and uh, that can happen here too, all right? So this is the idea. It's just affect plus probability, both on zero and one, all right? But they also are in a network where other people's passions and calculations weigh on them. So it's your solo disposition plus the sum of the weighted dispositions of others in your network. Now the weights are gonna turn out to be endogenous, although we won't have time to go through that. So I'm reducing you know, two n parameters in this model by making all the weights emerge from affective homophily. Again, we can come back to all of that. Uh, they act if their total disposition exceeds the threshold, or if you subtract the threshold, when their net disposition is positive. So it's a very simple rule, just says, act if net disposition is positive. I like simple rules. What's interesting though, it's not the contagion of observable action. It's not a monkey see, monkey do picture because the guy in the Southwest can't see what the others do. He's only looking at his immediate neighborhood, but he's receiving these dispositional signals from the others. Uh, another problem with imitation as a mechanism is that there's no mechanism for the first actor. I mean, if I'm the first guy to go, there's nobody to imitate. So agent zero tries to give some mechanism for the first actor, which I think is also uh, might be a useful thing. All right, under the hood, here's the large scale equation I just mentioned. We'll come back to this. The fear evolution is governed by a famous, uh, and, 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 you know, credible mathematical equation published by Ruscola and Wagner in the early 70s that's about fear conditioning. This is apparatus, the alphas and betas and gamma are, are, I extended the model so that I can generate a wider variety of curves. But for the runs I published, the only parameter is just this learning curve. Uh, gamma is zero and alpha times beta are just collapsed into a learning parameter K. So there's one parameter for the fear learning. I'll talk about the neuroscience of this. There's also, they're taking a moving average of the local relative frequency of activations. So their memory, M, is a third parameter. And as I say, the weights are endogenous. Uh, we can come back to that, but they're a type of affective homophily. You, you align with those with whom you're emotionally uh, in accord, okay? And again, it's get the synthesis started with provisional, plausible, testable modules. The book has differential equations and agents. Now the subtitle is toward neurocognitive foundations. We talked about generative social science. What is all this neuroscience business? So uh, we care about fear acquisition, fear extinction, especially in connection with cycles and waves and so on. So now I'll talk a little bit about some neuroscience. Uh, again, I do so with the greatest hesitance and humility. But the idea here and I've learned a lot from my colleague, Joe Ledoux at NYU. The main, the main actor in all of this is the amygdaloid complex. And essentially, when there's a, 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 a stimulus that is either innately fearful or you have conditioned to fear, their signals are sent to these parts of the brain that activate the amygdala that then stimulates the release of hormones that you see, you know, epinephrine, adrenaline, your blood pressure goes up, you freeze, all sorts of things happen. And they're basically mechanical results of this amygdala response. We know a good deal about where this thing is and have studied it in detail. I don't care where it is. I just care that it's automatic, fast, and really inaccessible to deliberation. When I throw a snake in your lap, the first thing you do is freeze by this, what Joe Ledoux calls the low road. Then later, you look at the snake and say, oh, you know, it's just a garden snake, not a black mamba. But that's slower. 
the deliberative component is after the emotional one. All right? So the amygdala does this before you can think about it. We even can condition people to make associations while they're asleep. Very interesting work has been done on the non-conscious aspects of fear learning. All right, here's how it goes. Uh, here's a, a, here's the, uh, an fMRI of a, of, a, of a subject. This lower panel is the blood recruitment to their amygdala, which is a crude representation of amygdala activation. Uh, but the idea here, the standard trial is, I show you a blue light, nothing happens. If I put a shock cuff on you and shock you randomly, your amygdala lights up. That's a scary event, an aversive event, and you're wondering what's going on. If I now begin pairing them, so it's blue light shock, blue light shock, blue light shock, then I show you the blue light alone and you get this registration. So the blue light has become closely associated with the aversive event and the presentation of the blue light alone can stimulate the fear. And this is what's happening to agent zero on the landscape. It's yellow sight, ambush, yellow sight, ambush, yellow sight, ambush, and soon yellow sight alone is scary and he wipes out his village. And there's a nice little model of this, the Ristola Wagner model, uh, that I'm using in Agent Zero that just says the gain in associative strength is a learning parameter times maximum associative strength, typically one, minus current associative strength. And alpha and beta are surprise and salience. If it's not surprising, I don't learn. And if I don't notice it, I don't learn. You have to have it be noticeable and surprising. And this is the curve you get. And this is uh, the curve we see in many, many uh, trials. Again, I'm not modeling brain regions. I'm modeling an associative capacity conferred by that architecture and explained by it. But I'm saying, look, the neuroscience licenses this very simple modeling and, and its interpretation, all right? And Hume himself, uh, thought this was his big contribution. He said, after the constant conjunction of two objects, we are determined by custom alone to expect the one from the other. Having found in many instances that two kinds of things, flame and heat, snow and cold, blue light shock, have always been conjoined. If the flame or the snow or the blue light be presented anew, the mind is carried by custom to expect heat or cold. It is not by reasoning, moreover, that we form the connection. All these operations are a species of natural instinct, which no reasoning or process of the thought and understanding is able either to produce or to prevent. So it's very important that this component of the agent is not conscious, it's inaccessible to ratiocination, but it's a part of the human condition and belongs in our human models. So it's in agent zero in that crude way. All right, it's a great thing to have, of course, because, uh, I can use the same, it's a marvel that the same uh, equipment that taught Pleistocene man to fear rhinoceroses is the same equipment we use to be afraid when a BMW whips around the corner at us. It's, 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 a, it's a miracle that the same neurochemical computing could adapt to modern circumstances. So that's wonderful, but it's also double-edged, right? You can form all sorts of invidious uh, associations or be trained to form them, racial ones and other ones without your conscious knowledge. So, you know, the red yellow sites and the occupiers, I mean, Vietnamese face ambush, Vietnamese face ambush, Mulai massacre, Arab face 9 11, you know, and you think, you know, all Muslims are terrorists. Japanese face Pearl Harbor, mass internment of Japanese. Doctors, Tuskegee experiment, large scale distrust of the medical establishment, MMR vaccine, autism, financial assets, panic, all of these things have the same fundamental, you know, the affective component, I think, unfolds along these lines, crudely speaking. Another sort of good and bad thing about it is you're supposed to stay afraid of hippos. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to learn to fear hippos Monday and then forget to fear them uh, Tuesday. Those agents are not observed because they got trampled by hippos. So, Affect can remain above the threshold long after the actual stimulus has stopped. Uh, and of course, extinction may not be very far off. The extreme case is PTSD. And also I think addiction is also an extreme case. We're gonna to try to substitute a neurobiology of addiction for the affective module. And I think 
we could do interesting work on smoking alcohol opioids, all of which I'm trying to do. Uh, fear acquisition and extinction are not symmetrical. The affective trajectory uh, is concave up. The forgetting is concave down. This is, this is confirmed in a million animal model trials. Uh, and if you'd like to put it all in one equation and you like heavy side unit step functions, it's possible to do that. The main point of all of this is that, you know, I say we're not, we don't fear what the rat fears, but we fear how the rat fears. This architecture, Joe Ledoux calls them survival circuits, have been conserved across vertebrate evolution. So it's really a, 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 a you know, a hardwired component. All right, that's fear. We're also saying it's contagious. Adam Smith, uh, people don't realize how worried Adam Smith was about emotions. And he talks about them a great deal uh, in the theory of moral sentiments. And they're at work in financial panics and all sorts of other things. But again, is fear contagious? Can I say that? Is that a, is that a licensed proposition? I think so. Here's a nice experiment. Here's the experiment we looked at before, where this individual, David Mendez, is being conditioned to fear the blue light. Blue light shock, blue light shock, blue light shock. That's his thing. The real experiment, though, concerns an observer of those conditioning trials. That's his amygdala. He's watching David be blue shocked. Blue light shock, blue light shock, blue light shock. Then we show him the blue light, and his amygdala recruits as well. That's a good thing, because I can learn to fear the fire by watching somebody else get burned. But the downside is also clear. I can rapidly acquire uh, all kinds of fears that may be baseless or invidious or nefarious from others too. And we need to be aware of this. I'm not saying it's insurmountable, but I'm saying part of know thyself is to understand that all of this is at work in our, how we receive political messages and all sorts of other things. All right, so one ingredient is emotion. Uh, and we are gonna give agents weights. I'll come back to that if you like. Uh, there is reasoning going on, there is deliberation, but the deliberative component is very limited, right? We usually have crummy information to begin with and we make bad appraisals of it. There's a huge ocean of documented departures from canonical rationality, including framing effects, endowment effects, representativeness, bait rate, base rate neglect, anchoring on what you hear first. Agent zero is a local relative frequentist that actually involves several of these. Uh, to make matters worse, they're driven by, you know, they're driven by unconscious emotions, doing bad statistics on incomplete data. They also influence one another. And in these collectivities, they can produce a very widespread convergence on very counterproductive behavior, all right? Through conformity effects. So what about conformity? Is there any neural science of that? Yeah, there is. Uh, Ethan Cross and others uh, have done very interesting work on fMRIs about rejection. And they find that areas that support the components of physical pain become active when agents uh, experience rejection, humans experience rejection. So here's an experiment they did. Uh, these illuminated parts are parts of the brain governing physical, physical pain. Uh, and what they do is they put the person in a fMRI and they show them images of the wife who abandoned them, the team that kicked them out, the group that ostracized them, other things. And when they're shown these groups that rejected them, they are in emotional pain and quite literally these parts of the brain light up. Again, this is all very suggestive and crude. And for me, I don't claim to be an expert on any of it. I'm just saying, look, is there some grounds for modeling this way? And I think the answer is yes. But this is all very deep neuroscience, but it's going on and they're showing these relationships. So, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do that with agent zero. All right, we conform because rejection hurts. They write, these results can do meaning to the idea that it hurts, rejection and physical pain are similar, not only that they're distressing, they share a common somatosensory representation. So we give other weights. So network weights are part of this too. I, I don't have time here to talk about endogenous weights, but that, that happens too. All right, so given these components, let's put the model through its paces and then talk about some extensions, including perhaps addiction. So we have disposition is formed, it's compared to a threshold and they act. Of course, that changes their environment. 
So there's feedback between agent behavior and the environment. Uh, and all these runs are in the book. And I, every single assumption, everything that I'm showing you, everything that was published is completely replicable. So you may think it's all baloney, but it's replicable baloney. And to me, that's important. Uh, here's the run we talked about before. I'll just show you that again quickly. Again, these guys are fear conditioning. They're calculating relative frequencies, forming a disposition, wiping out their village. And this guy wipes out his village. He joins the lynch mob, even though he's never had a bad experience with black people. Why? Because total disposition exceeds his threshold, even though his threshold exceeds his solo disposition. All right? I call that the condition humaine, which is a play on the human condition and the word conditioning. But that's quite beside the point. Here, the point is, even though being negatively disposed in the net sense, uh, he acts, and in some cases, he can be the first to act, which is really quite, I think, quite provocative. Here, again, the Southwestern agent has no direct stimulus, but he goes first. And it's not through imitation of behavior because the agents in the Northeast have not acted. Here's that result. Agent zero, he goes first without stimulus. I think that's a really interesting result and it raises the question, you know, what, what do we mean by leadership, right? He's the first to go. Is that because he's a man of action, full of conviction, driven by his, you know, you know by his convictions? Or is he just the most susceptible to dispositional contagion? Uh, Tolstoy's answer is very clear. He writes in War and Peace, a king is history's slave, performing for the swarm life. And there's lots of literature on this. Uh, I know it's rude to read your own stuff, but I think this summarizes my feeling about Agent Zero as a model of the human condition. So the overall picture of Homo sapiens reflected in these interpretations of Agent Zero is unsettling. Here we have a creature evolved, that is selected for high susceptibility to unconscious fear conditioning, fear, conscious or otherwise, can be acquired rapidly through direct exposure or indirectly through fearful others. This primal emotion is moderated by a more recently evolved deliberative module, which at best operates suboptimally on incomplete data and whose risk appraisals are normally biased further by affect itself. Both affective and cognitive modules, moreover, are powerfully influenced by the dispositions of similar, equally limited and unconsciously driven agents. Is it any wonder that collectivities of interacting agents of this type, the agent zero type, can exhibit mass violence, dysfunctional health behaviors, and financial panic. Hello, Dr. Epstein. Yeah. I just wanted to check in, let you know, we're just about out of time. Okay. Um, if, if we do me, have a question, me, if you want to wrap up. Let me blast ahead and just talk a little bit about the addiction idea, Great. all right? Thank you. All right, so they can flee, networks matter, all these things can happen. Uh, but I wanted particularly to talk about some extensions, one of which is to put agents on networks. That's a big, big move. But today I thought, uh, is there a way to use Agent Zero to study addiction to nicotine, opioids, alcohol, all sorts of other things? And the, the idea that I'd love to pursue with, with my colleagues, you, you, you all, is to take Agent Zero and remove the effective module and put in something about the neurobiology of addiction in general. Replace the social module with networks of promoter and suppressor nodes. You might be in a network that pro who promotes smoking. You might be in one that suppresses it. But put agents in networks where there, these, there are these social influences that change as these people acquire a habit or quit the habit and replace the deliberative module with risk appraisals on some message landscape. So you're hearing, you know, this is your brain on drugs, or you're hearing, you know, a positive message about heroin, what have you. And morph agent zero into an addict zero model. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe pick up a theme we pursued a while ago with, with, uh, with others on smoking behavior uh, before agent modeling was, was quite at this point, before there was an agent zero to use, but the idea was, these are very crude uh, plots. Uh, they've probably been overtaken by events of basically, you know, sustained exposure 
and the probability of addiction on the left, or sustained exposure and the probability of secession on the right. Are there simple equations you could stick into the agent zero effective module that would, uh, that would use these data or better ones? But basically put a simple equation of addiction into agent zero's effective module, put them in networks. Tom Valenti at one point did a lot of work on networks of friends and so forth, but this could be improved, no doubt, but put them in networks of others and try to grow the transition probabilities that Castor and others have so admirably calculated. You know, we have these transition probabilities from state to state, smoker to non-smoker, uh, and so forth. Uh, and those explain what has happened, but it doesn't explain why. And again, to go back to my generative explanatory standard, it would be nice to build lower level agents that generate those observed probabilities as the targets. Right, and that might suggest policies to change them for the better. So I'm very interested in pursuing that. Uh, so my agenda, build toy models to gain insight. Uh, the dialogue between equations and agents is very illuminating. Build these big models, but populate them with cognitively plausible adaptive agents. So that's what I had in mind, and I thank you, and I apologize if I've overrun my time, and I welcome questions, comments, criticisms, and follow-ups at this email. Thank you very much, Dr. Epstein, for a very interesting talk. Um, I just got a couple questions um, coming in that they're wondering about the slides being available, and I just want to remind everyone that this event is being recorded, and it'll be available on our website in the next couple of days. Right. Um, and we do have one question which you touched on briefly at the end. Um, I'll just reiterate. How can your ideas of Agent Zero and tools for modeling cognitive behavior be applied to modeling tobacco use and addictions? Again, I mean, I, I, that's a good question, and I, I said a little about that, but I think the idea is, you know, for example, uh, that business about fear extinction. You know, I think a lot of, a lot of modeling, I'm sorry to say, in, in opio I mean, I'm doing some work on opioids, I'm doing work on alcohol, and I'd like to go back to doing work on smoking, uh, but, but really very little of it includes these inside the agent dynamics. And uh, if we were to include them, then you'd get a representation of, you know, how difficult it is to quit. And in the, in the sort of life, the addiction course of the agent, you know, early in their addiction, information and medicine, early in their exposure to the, to the uh, you know, to the stimulus, say cigarettes, then they have uh, the capacity to quit. Once they're highly dependent, then a lot of those considerations just fade. So one story is how do you preempt the, 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 the dependence from superseding these deliberative and other, other, other components? I also, in some of these calculations, certainly when we think about opioids, another thing is the perceived opportunity cost of, of being dependent on a drug. I mean, you know, you just don't see that many of the Stanford seniors or the Harvard Business School kids getting addicted to heroin because they have a huge amount to lose. But, you know, in communities where this is a problem, uh, you know, these are the disease of despair type of argument. And I think one important point is to improve the economic and social prospects of these communities. So there's a long-term time scale to think about, and there's a short-term addiction dynamics uh, to think about. But the main thing, not, that's a, a, a kind of a disorganized answer. I think the main point is take agent zero and think there are three modules. There's a bio one, a deliberative one, and a social one. And morph those into the addiction, uh, the corresponding addiction modules, and try to build a general model of addiction, and then specialize it to smoking, opioids, alcohol, what have you. That's, that, I think I'm very excited about doing that. Great, thank you. Um, just maybe time for one quick question. Um, we won't have time for all of them, but um, this question is, I'm curious on your thoughts on social media networks and how information or misinformation can change or mutate while it spreads. Are there ways to account for this in the models? Well, we're doing a complete one. one yes, we're, I, think, I think the crude answer is yes. I also think it's a young field, but it's improving rapidly. So I'm on a project with uh, with, with several people, at, uh, we have this NSF 
COVID rapid project. And the idea there is really to take this coupled contagion idea seriously and model the contagion of COVID, but also the contagion of messages about COVID and study how they may interact. So the, what we're doing right now, we have very huge uh, Twitter mining uh, headed by David Bronyatovsky at George Washington, who's done a lot on the spread of misinformation and, and, and those topics. Uh, and we've got very nice data now on you know, Twitter, uh, Twitter traffic on search terms like flatten the curve, COVID-19, social distancing. And you can get some impression of the level of concern about these topics with all the caveats thereunto pertaining. Uh, but yes, we have this nice data, state by state data for all of the US. And we also have a nice clean SEIR epidemic model that we've calibrated to the disease trajectories in those states. And in some cases, it's quite clear that the disease takes off, the Twitter verse explodes, that stimulates uh, isolating behavior, which suppresses the disease, but then people stop being vigilant. They, they get complacent, they come out, and you get other spikes. And this is the fundamental dynamic that we're worrying about with COVID. And I think the interesting modeling advance would be to, to include uh, the, the, the fear contagion based in Twitter and other social media data and couple it to the epidemic dynamics. Not all the stories are, are that clean, um, but I think this is a, a really kind of a watershed that lets us really study attitudinal contagions along with disease contagions. And we have another model about that has two fears. There's the disease, there's fear of the disease, there's also fear of the vaccine, and in the two fear model, you can get all kinds of interesting dynamics, but including subsequent waves from vaccine refusal. So again, I think all of this is a, a really big step for uh, the social and behavioral sciences to be able to study the fundamental phenomenon like the disease, but as it interacts with these attitudinal, contagious attitudinal dynamics. Josh, uh, Josh uh, thank you so much. This has been a very fascinating, uh, fascinating talk. And, and um, we hope that you'll be uh, available again to continue this conversation um, in, in the future. So um, uh, everyone, thank you for your participation. And uh, there's going to be a brief uh, survey after the event is over that will help us plan future events. Uh, um, again, um, uh, Josh, uh, we are really in debt with you. This has been a, a, a terrific presentation and uh, uh, we hope to continue this discussion. So thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to continue the discussions and with everyone. So don't hesitate. Talk to you soon, David. Thank you.